Soul Winning Workshop number five. I've got the title of my little lesson that I'm going to be teaching on today is Red Flags and False Flags. So, um, yeah, it's not going to be as cool as it sounds. <laughs> But basically, you know, there's certain things that are really common that people say at the door and they can be a big red flag when you're trying to determine whether or not a person's saved. So it'll help you to be able to figure out maybe how in depth you need to go into a certain subject when people say different things. And I'm going to go over... Um, a few of the common phrases to come in. There's a lot more. I just real quickly off the top of my head kind of wrote, jotted down a few things that I hear all the time that to me are, are kind of red flags that a person might not be saved, even though sometimes they'll give you the right answers. And, that, and this is kind of the, the key is we're talking to people who sometimes will have given you the, the right answer, but you still you know, for one, it's safe to assume that pretty much everybody you talk to is not saved. And I always operate under that assumption with everybody. I'd rather be, be wrong in that regard when you're trying to go soul winning than to assume that somebody's saved and, and, and they're not saved, right? I mean, you always want to err on the side of caution and, and try to challenge yeah especially baptists and that's that's you know that's actually my first point is that you know where a person goes to church a lot can be gathered from that alone and that's usually why we ask when we go up to the door we'll say hey you know we're from word of truth baptist church can i give you an invitation to our church and then ask well do you go to church anywhere already do you have a church that you go to um it's not just small talk it's it's a good it's a really good question because it gives you you can learn so much about what a person believes usually based on the church that they're currently attending. So if it's a Pentecostal church, then okay, they probably believe they could lose their salvation. You know, if they, maybe they even believe you need to be baptized to be saved. If it's a Catholic church, I mean, you know, they're completely trusting in works. It's not of grace. Even though, and, and especially, you know, someone says they're going to a Catholic church, it's pretty safe to assume that they're not saved, even if, and sometimes a person will give you the right answer. They'll say, well, yeah, we're saved because we believe in God. And usually that's just a real, people say, well, I believe in God. You know, and it's, they're not real specific about believing in Jesus Christ. Although when you ask them that, they just say, oh, yeah, yeah, you know, I believe in Jesus. But um, they'll just kind of give you a, a vague, generic answer. Well, I believe in God. Or, or, you know, people have heard, well, faith saves, or faith saves us. Oh, yeah, okay. But they don't really trust in faith alone. They, they're trusting that, well, you know, you still got to be a pretty good person, you go to church and do all these other things. So um, anyways, I'm not going to get into all of that. But yeah, where a person goes to church can be a big indicator. Now, also on the flip side of that, don't assume that someone's saved just because they say they go to a Baptist church or an independent fundamental Baptist church, a King James only Baptist church. These are all things that, you know, you need to take the information for what it is now, you may think, okay, this person's probably saved, but you still ought to have the same level of, of you know, inquiring and, and asking. Um, if someone's going to an independent, fundamental Baptist church, they tell you it's by faith alone and stuff. I mean, obviously, like, there's only so far you probably need to go with someone like that. But if anyone said, you know, a lot of other, but I don't want to dismiss and just say, oh yeah, well, they're just saved. You know, you still ask the questions. You still ask if you think they can lose their salvation. You still kind of go through the same routine. But um, what these phrases can do will help us to determine maybe what we need to spend more time on. And, you know, just, I have a, I have a verse here, some verses from John 10 of why I believe people, even if they give you the right answers, like if they say, I'm going to a Catholic church, or I'm going to this Pentecostal church or whatever, why well, I don't believe that they're saved. Um, one of the reasons, usually, I mean, you question them long enough anyways, it'll say they're not saved, that you'll, you'll, it'll be uncovered that they're not saved. But um, in John 10, verse 2, Jesus said, But he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice. And he calleth his own sheep by name, and leadeth them out. And when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. And a stranger will they not follow, but will flee from him, for they know not the voice of strangers. 
So, you know, when you're saved, when you get saved, you've got the Holy Spirit residing inside of you. Even if you're just a babe in Christ, even if you're very unlearned, and even if it's easy for you to be deceived by different things, ultimately you're not going to be, you know, like, you shouldn't be deceived by these, by the charismatics that are slapping people in the forehead and people falling down on the ground and, and shaking and, by, you know, like, like that type of thing it should not deceive you. Um, and, and I believe that. But obviously, regardless of what you even believe about that, what I'm teaching today, and I don't want to get too far off topic, what I'm teaching today is just about red flags that come up. So the first red flag is the church that they go to, right? But another common phrase to look out for is when people, when you ask them about salvation, they say, well, I gave my life to Jesus. Now, these phrases I'm going to list, they're all very common and popular, right? And this is where the false flag also comes in, is that oftentimes people will say things that they don't literally mean. They actually mean something else, but they're using the phrase because they've heard it so many times. A perfect example is this, is someone that says, well, you have to repent of your sins to be saved. Okay. Huge red flag, right? Salvation's by faith alone. It has nothing to do with you giving up your sinful life and doing all this other stuff that, 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 many people believe is necessary or requirement for salvation. So that's a huge flag. And I will all, when someone says they repent, you have to repent of your sins to be saved, I will always question and go into that subject and that topic because that's a big red flag. Now, I have had, and this is where the false flag comes up, the false red flag, where it's like, whoa, wait a minute, you don't have to do that to be saved. And then you kind of talk to them and say, well, what do you mean by that? And what, you know, like, like what do you really have to do? And they still just, if, if they stick strong with, well, no, you just have to believe. You know, they're just repeating things that they've heard over and over again in church or wherever. So, but it still is a red flag. It's still something you need to, to look at a little bit closer. Um, they, when I said gave my life to Jesus, you know, Jesus gave his life for us. We don't have to give our lives for him. There's this growing movement of people who believe in a lordship salvation. People say you have to make Jesus the Lord of your life. And that's another thing people might say, well, well, you have to make Jesus Lord. And no, you don't. I mean, making him the Lord of your life means he's telling you what to do and you're obeying, you're obeying your Lord and doing those things. That is doing works. That is obeying works for salvation if you have to make him Lord and just completely submit and do everything that he tells you to do. Now, should we do that? Yes, of course. Is Jesus Lord? Yes. But that is not the, the, the making him the Lord of your life for salvation is a, is a, is a slippery slope works-based salvation. At the bottom line. So when people use these phrases, again, oftentimes they're mostly just repeating what they've heard. But then even all the more reason to, to really go into detail about it because if they're repeating what they've heard, they've been hearing the wrong things. John MacArthur is a huge, huge lordship salvation, like a real popular preacher. He even has a study Bible out and, and you know, is real popular I think even amongst like evangelical Christians and stuff. So people who normally might give you the right answers of, of salvation, just kind of say, oh yeah, I believe it's in Jesus, or you know, I believe it's all through Jesus. And, um, but how do you get that salvation? Is it because you've made him your Lord? Is it because you're, you're doing the thing? You know, these are the, the, the things that we need to look out for. And then the last phrase I have on here is when people say, well, you have to ask for forgiveness. To be saved. You always have to ask for forgiveness. Most people that use that phrase think that you have to ask for forgiveness every time you sin. Every time you do something, well, I, I, you know, I ask for forgiveness. How do you know you're going to have? Well, you know, I pray every night and I, and I ask for forgiveness. So God forgives because he's forgiving God. And again, they're, they're missing it. You only need to be saved one time, obviously. Um, it's not this continual thing of asking for forgiveness. People say, well, don't you ask for forgiveness? And see, there's a difference. Like, yes, and I ask for God's mercy when I do screw up, when I do sin, I'll confess my sins to, to God, right? But that has nothing to do with salvation, and, and it's, you know, they're two separate things, and you need to make sure that that distinction is clearly made and really find out what they believe. And again, all of these phrases come as a result of just teaching, hearing stuff, whether it be the radio, whether it be books, whether it be church, People hear these things over and over and over again. They kind of sound good. They sound, you know, 
you know, repent of your sins, turn from sin to the Savior, right? They have these, these catchy little sayings that if you don't really analyze and think about it too hard, you just pick it up and run with it, right? I mean, the preacher's saying it, other people are saying it, and pretty soon you start saying it. But they're all red flags about false doctrines and false beliefs and false gospels that we need to just look out for so that you can spend enough time and not, and not just assume that people are saved. One of, the, one of the most dangerous things we could do, well, not dangerous, but you know, one of the things you don't really want to do at all is assume that somebody is saved when they're not. And then maybe even leave giving them a false sense of assurance that they are saved when they're not. So, um, let's see. Oh, and I have one other point because this one was kind of, because the whole workshop was kind of short with what I was, what I wanted to teach and what I wanted to, to bring up. Um, you know, if a person says one of these things, any of those phrases I mentioned, it doesn't automatically mean they're not saved. Right? It doesn't just mean, oh, well, they're not saved because they said that. Oftentimes, as I mentioned, you know, people will just repeat stuff. But it's good to, to question further. But one last point I want to make is that um, choose your words carefully. When you're, when you're going through the Bible or giving examples, usually with the hypothetical examples, um, one of the things that came up in our soul winning and a point that I had mentioned in the past was when you make up an example or a story, because I usually, I've been real big about, about saying, come up with a scenario, right? To understand what a person's trusting and what are they believing in. And you're using an example of someone who believes on Jesus, but then they do all kinds of sins, they do all kinds of bad things. Are they still saying, you know, you ask these types of questions and it's a hypothetical situation to see what do they believe about it? And my, my point with this is choosing your words is I think it's always better to use a fictitious, a fake third person. Don't use yourself as the example and don't use the person that you're talking to as the example. And, and here's the reason why, especially if you're going to say something like there may be a person who does believe theoretically it is possible for a person to lose their salvation yes. if they were to commit you know, X, Y, and Z sins, right? If they were to go off and do these things. But when you apply the story to them personally, they'll say, well, no, I can't lose my salvation because they're thinking in their head, I would never murder somebody. I would never do these other things so I can't lose my salvation because I would never do these things that could cause a person to lose their salvation. So hopefully that makes sense. You know, we're, we're, when you put it off of them, then you can help to get to the core of, well, what do they really believe? Uh, do they believe it is possible? Because if they believe it's possible, even if they think they'll never do it, if they think that there is possibly something they can do to lose their salvation, then they're not saved. I mean, they're not believing in eternal life. They don't have that free gift. So uh, it's just wise, I believe, to, to come up with a completely separate example of, of, of just, let's just say, for example, there's a person and his name's Jose and he's standing right here next to us, right? I mean, and Jose believes on Jesus Christ and then just make everything about this person, this fictitious person who doesn't exist. Because then you can say things, you can make it up however you want. You could say, you know, God sees, I usually make a point to say, well, God sees his heart. He really does believe. Because a lot of people will say, oh, well, you know, if he just says he believes, you know, anyone could say they believe, but then he must not have really believed if he went and did those things. So in my story, I say, well, in this story, this guy actually believes, and God sees his heart and he believes. You know, so is he saved? And then, you know, yeah, if you, you know, he believed, then yes. And then you can continue asking the questions about that guy. Maybe later on he screws up, does all kinds of bad things or whatever. Um, but I just wanted to make mention of that and kind of group that in with, with this other tip or pointer because it's not really a... Not really a long, a long lesson today, but um, just little things to, to look out for, little things to, to pick up. I'm sure you probably, if you've gone to soul winning a bunch, are familiar with other phrases that come up that people use all the time that could be an indicator of, uh, of their false belief or false doctrine. But um, hopefully this helps you out. And if anybody wants to, is there any questions? And I, sometimes I forget to open up the floor to questions afterward about what we just went over. If there's anything that you want to ask at all, or is it okay? Good. 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 All right. <laughs>
Cool. And um, if you want to stick around and practice for a little while, that is fine. Um, there's not a whole lot to practice on this. Is that a question? I have something that I kind of want to learn more on. Okay. That came to me During while you were doing this. Okay. Um, and it might be short, and maybe it might even be redundant. I don't know. But the baptism, like for people who believe you have to be baptized. To be saved? To be saved. I don't really know where to turn for that, to be honest. So. First Corinthians. <coughs> You know, I'll probably do a whole section on baptism, but um, but for this, I think that'd be a good one to do. That's my suggestion. <laughs> well, because the, what they're gonna do, they're gonna turn to there's there's a few things. They're gonna turn to Mark 16. Mark 16 says, um, well, I'll just if you they, yeah, whosoever believeth and is baptized shall be saved. But he that believeth not shall be damned. So, because the, these they they rely on just a couple verses, yeah, to believe that baptism saved. And then they turn to Acts chapter two, um, two Acts two thirty eight says, um, and they said, sir, you know, they said, what shall we do? And they said, and you know, Peter said, uh, repent and be baptized. Um, Every one of them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. So, like, they said, what shall we do? And he said, repent and be baptized. So, yeah, that's what shall we do. It doesn't say, what do I have to do in order to be saved, right? Acts 16 tells you, what must I do to be saved, very clearly. Right. Acts 2.38, it's like, well, what shall we do? Well, yeah, everybody should repent and everybody should get baptized, right? I mean, there's nothing wrong with that statement, but that doesn't mean that that is all the requirements for salvation. That's not what they asked. They said, what should we do? Mark 16 says, uh, hold on, I'll, I'll get there real quick. There's, um, Mark 16 says, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. So there they say, see, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. But then it says, but he that believeth not shall be damned. Doesn't mention baptism at all. Yeah. Obviously, the, 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 you know, what verse is that? I'm sorry. Mark 16, 16. 16, 16. Okay. But what I like to do is go to 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 1. Verse 17. The Apostle Paul, if you get someone to admit it, would the Apostle Paul preach the gospel and get people saved? They'd be pretty stupid or ignorant of the Bible to say that he didn't, right? Right. And that was one of his jobs. 1 Corinthians 1.17, the Apostle Paul speaking, right, says, For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, as the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. So you mean to tell me that the Apostle Paul, who went around and getting tons of people saved, was not sent to baptize, yet you have to be baptized to be saved? It doesn't make any sense, right? right? I mean, it's a very good argument to make. The Apostle Paul, of all people, right? right. The Apostle Paul was not sent to baptize. If, 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 if people need to be saved, I mean, isn't he sent to, to be saved, to, to save people? Isn't that, isn't that his job, to get people saved? Then why isn't he baptizing people if baptism is necessary? And what's good about this verse is that this is 1 Corinthians. This is after, because people sometimes will believe in different dispensations. They say, well, baptism was only a requirement after, you know, Jesus rose again from the dead. Because you could also say, well, what about the thief on the cross? Jesus said, this day shalt thou be with me in paradise. He wasn't baptized. He believed right on the cross. He didn't get baptized. And they'll say, oh, 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 oh. Well, that didn't really go into effect until Jesus' resurrection. You know, I mean, because they, they have, because there's no way to, there's no way around it. Right? I mean, it, it's, it's a blaring contradiction in their doctrine. So they have to come, and they have to come up with a time. I mean, John the Baptist was like the first one baptizing people. So what about people before John the Baptist? What about people that died before Jesus Christ, even went to the cross, but were baptized by John the Baptist? What about those people? What, you know, like, like there's all these questions and these false doctrines. They can't answer them. 
But the verses specifically I like to use, I, I'll, you know, I refer to the thief on the cross, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, here where Paul says, I wasn't sent to baptize. And I'll even use their own verses against them because Mark 16, 16 does not, that does not say you have to be baptized to be saved. It just says, he that is baptized, believes and is baptized. Now, do you believe? Yes. Are you baptized? Yes. You're saved. It's a statement. Yeah. It's a statement. It doesn't say you have to be baptized to be saved. It just says, hey, whosoever, right? Or he that believeth and is baptized. I believe I'm baptized. Guess what? I'm saved. Well, even if I took out the and is baptized part, the statement is still true because that the belief is the only thing that's required. Okay. It's not about baptism. No. Okay. It kind of goes hand in hand. The dispen dispensation. Yeah, dispen I was gonna say dispensationalism. Um, right. Do you believe that people who believe this whole dispensation thing could still be saved? Yes. Okay. It depends though on what they believe about it, because there's people have varying degrees of dispensational <laughs> beliefs. Okay. Hyper, what's called hyper dispensationalism is people who believe that like salvation is different in the different time period. So like people who say, well, people were saved by the works of the law in the Old Testament. And then now we're in the age of grace and we're, we're only saved by grace. And then in the future, you know, people are going to be saved by works again and all the other stuff. Those people probably aren't saved. Because it's very clear. Now, you could be very, very confused. Someone can be just mixed up and has been deceived. But what I would do, if you could show them Romans 4, and if they don't receive that, like if they're not just, because it's clear. It's clear. I mean, Romans 4 clearly says, I mean, it talks about Abraham. It talks about David. I mean, these are Old Testament people. They weren't relying on works for salvation. And the Bible... My stepdad is really into this dispensation thing, and I don't know, he always says, oh, we're under grace, you know, we're not under the law, and I try to explain, like, okay, we're not under the law, but we still, you know, it's not okay for me to go have a relationship right. with an animal. Right. It's like the most insane thing I could use. Well, Romans 6, <sighs> Romans 6. I have so many... For that, for that answer, because if, you, if, if, if they're trying to say that we don't have to obey the law at all, because we're under grace, that like basically there is no law. Yeah. Well, sin is the transgression of the law. Right. That is what sin is. And Romans 6 says in verse 1, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. Yeah, I have that. So he's saying like, of course not. Of course we shouldn't continue. And how could you even still continue to have sin yeah. if there is no law? If, there is, if the law ceases to exist, there is no sin. Right. He, but it's retarded. It it's, it's, retarded. It's, it's because, it's because <laughs> it's people so don't retarded. want to follow the law. Yeah. So they just say, well, we're under grace. He does that. And you know, he answers every single question right on... On salvation. And have I you do believe he's have you have you have you gone in depth on an example I of someone that. of someone who believes and then they screw up and do all kinds of really bad things? Does he still say they're saved? Yeah, he does. He's like I said, and I even use me so he could like. I mean, I've tried it a couple different ways. He thinks that I need less Bible and more internet, and I think he needs less internet and more Bible because he goes to that Jesus is Savior dot org website all the time. Oh, okay. And there is some really good information. Yeah, there's some good. I mean, that guy's there's there's some yeah there, there's some false doctrines there obviously, false but there. And so, but like that guy doesn't believe in dispensationalism at least I don't think not hyper dispensationalism he, is like he might old but old school Tennessee like Southern Baptist meets. How would that make sense? Go online and read less Bible. Well, yeah, it doesn't make any doesn't, sense at all. He's like, I think that, you, you know, he's he tries to use stuff all the time, like the world is changing. I'm like, but God hasn't changed. And then, right. and he, you know, I'm, he's old enough to make, be my grandfather, yeah. so he's kind of like stuck in his ways. Mm -hmm. And I do believe that he's saved. I just think he never grew. Like, I think no, he, just, he, he might, yeah, he might be. I, I th I've known people who are saved that, that get caught up in the dispensationalist doctrine, yeah. but not but not that bad usually like the ones that i know that i would that i would say are saved yeah. 
you usually aren't hyper, I, I don't know anyone that I believe is saved that's a hyper dispensationalist. So I don't know what he believes about the future. And so he kind of believes like in the past, like, cause I brought up, I'm like, well, we still had to call upon the Lord, you know, like yeah. before he came. And he's like, yeah, I know that, but things were different. They had the law then. And it's, so he's like believing in both. And I don't know how to yeah. tackle this man because he will not crack the it's Bible. It's, yeah. That's a problem too. And then. He has a That's the game. problem. He's got the right Bible. If you're not going to open up the Bible, then I mean, where are you going to get your answers from? He you're just believing in it. in tradition or what you've been taught before or whatever. Like, you need to get all of your answers from the Bible. This is my biggest hurdle as my stepdad. So I'm sorry if I ask a million questions because I'm trying. No, it's to, fine. I can't ever peg where he's at. He's right on salvation every single time, no matter how I ask him and like try to trick him. But then he has all these other weird theories. Does not make any sense? Well, that's, I mean, <laughs> it is what it is, as long yeah. as you're sure, you know, that he's... I that's don't a, question That's the salvation. other thing, is, like, people can know the answers to, even if you get, they can understand it, and they can know the answers, and even when you give them examples, they can give you the right answer, but that doesn't mean that they're saved. They can still, in their heart, not believe. Right. One of the one of the best indicators to tell if someone's saved is to open up the Bible, yeah. and to show them a pretty bait. That's why I said like Romans four is very clear on how people have been saved throughout time. How Abraham right. was not justified by his works; right. he was not. So if if we had to obey the law. It's, you know, like, it just simply does not, you know, he, he didn't have to do it. He's not justified before God. That's why it says, even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom um, righteousness is imputed without, or, or, um, without works. Saying, blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin, and whose, you know, sins and iniquities are covered. I mean, I'm, I'm kind of I'm kind of screwing up that verse, but... You have two examples of Old Testament people. Abraham was before the Mosaic Law. So you could say, oh, well, that's Abraham. That was before Moses. Right. Okay, because people will, will come. I've, I've heard them all before. I've heard all the arguments. Well, that was before Moses' Law. Yeah. Okay. Or what about, the well, then, well, what about David? Yeah. Because David was during the time of when you would say the Mosaic Law was in effect. Mm -hmm. Right? Yet David in Romans 4 is, is, and you could always go through the book of Psalms too, right. that, that tons of verses that talk about God's mercy and he won't remove his, his, his loving kindness from us. But Romans 4 is very clear, which is why I love going to it. Because uh, here's the thing is, what my point I was trying to make, especially with using clear verses and clear scriptures, is saying, you know, if you're saved, you should be able to receive God's word. Right. You should be able to see it for, what, for just for what it says. Right. And like if it, and it, and you know if there's one thing where they're like just just real stiff necked on, I'm not gonna say that just means they're automatically not saved. But if you talk about various doctrines of the Bible and not just talk about it, but like go to Scripture and look at it, and they could and they still like just just time after time after time, it's just they're not receiving it, they're not getting it, then I'd be like, yeah, they're probably not saved because they're just not get I mean, they're not, they're not getting it. They're not, and, and that's the, that's one of the indicators. And with some people, it becomes more difficult, yeah. especially when they give the right answers because you still don't know what their heart is truly believing. And using extreme examples is usually really good. Yeah. But, um, yeah, the dispensationalist, I mean, it's so stupid because that's, that, that doctrine was founded by, by Darby, by John Nelson Darby in the 1800s. Like, it's not even that old of a doctrine. So it was just invented. And he's like, well, the Romans is for the Romans, and Hebrews is for the Hebrews. And, like, if I quote something from Romans, but I don't tell him it's from the book of Romans, like, he gets it. He's like, yeah, for sure. And then I'm like, but that's from Romans. It, it, if you think that Romans isn't for us, then, like, and then... Another thing that really boggles my mind is that he really, with his heart, believes that if somebody is gay, they can repent from that and Jesus will save them. And I'm like, if you're a full-fledged sodomite... Yeah, well, well, here's what I wouldn't focus on. I wouldn't focus on the reprobate thing. He brings it up all the time. But I would say this, then, because that will, that will be a good example. Does that person have to stop being a sodomite to be saved? 
Oh, that's a good one. I should ask him that. Okay. Ask him that. Because then, what's he saying? If yes, then you believe in a works-based salvation because you have to quit sin in order to be saved. The Bible does not teach that. Okay. Do they have to stop being a sodomite to get saved? Yeah. Because he said repent, right? I mean, if they, have to, if they have to repent, if they have to change being a sodomite to not being a sodomite anymore, yeah. I think then, that's, then that's, that's work salvation. I may have been putting that word in there. I know that he says, if I'm he just can, saying, like, accept Jesus yeah. into his heart. I'm like, well, but here's, but here's the thing. That's why, like, I don't, with, with, with an issue like that, <clears throat> when there's all these other problems, yeah. I wouldn't waste the time on that one. I know. Just because you're probably not going to get anywhere. That's, that's, yeah. a, that's a little bit of a deeper doctrine. It's, it's still not very difficult, but whatever. You know what I mean? Like, like who cares if they think they could still be saved? I mean, you could still the, be But saved. The, the bigger question what that leads into, though, is can a person be saved and still be a sodomite? That's the real question. Yeah. Because most people will say, well, no. Yeah. Because that's just gross it's weird you know because they know how bad the, the yeah. sin is and stuff and they'll be like no way like no way is that person saved and they're still doing you know still committing those acts right but so then it's a work space but then it's but then it's well because spouse. because what i believe is that if a sodomite puts their faith in the lord jesus christ they are saved because that's what the bible says you have to do to be saved and they do not have to stop being a sodomite to be saved so you but i also believe that be saved do you think no uh, yeah i don't think no because saved. because they are incapable of putting their faith in christ yeah that's why I don't believe that, that sodomites can get saved. But it's not, it, what I'm saying is that, you know, Scripture does not contradict itself. Right. So if there were, let's say, let's say I am wrong okay. about Romans 1. I'm wrong that sodomites can't be saved. I'm, right. I'm completely wrong about that. Then if I'm wrong... All a sodomite has to do to be saved is the same as everybody, everybody else, and that's believe on Jesus Christ. So they don't have to stop committing that sin in order to be saved, just as much as you know, the next person doesn't have to stop drinking alcohol, the next person doesn't have to stop fornicating, the next person doesn't have to stop... You don't have to stop sin to be saved, right. no matter what the sin is. Right. You have to put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. I just don't think it's possible. I think their heart has been hardened right. and it is impossible for them to believe on Jesus Christ, which is evidenced by their actions of sodomy. Okay. I think that that just shows they've already been rejected. It's like a symptom. That's right. Okay. 